All right, so before I jump into the slides, I have a few announcements. So um, we're doing a lecture series on basic machine learning, and we did tools last time. And so we're going to start into methods, otherwise known as algorithms. And the meetup, you probably saw it, the announcement for this uh, this session, there's a link to slides and the notebook that I will be using during this talk. So, in fact, while I'm talking now, if you wanted to, you can launch, if you know how to launch a Jupyter notebook, you can play along with me if you like. And then uh, afterwards, we like to go to IHOP. And then there's a feedback form on the announcement for this meetup if you want to give some feedback, subjects you want to see, uh, you know, anything at all, something, anything at all that you want to, to help us to help you better. And then you can see my email here on this slide. Uh, so you can also continue the conversation if you have some machine learning project and you're stuck or, you know, anything at all, you can send me an email and, and I'd be happy to uh, talk privately with you. All right. So with that, let's get into it. So here's what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to define, I'm going to give some definitions. And oh, and by the way, as always, you can, you can ask questions. You can interrupt me, ask me to, to uh, elaborate on anything that I won't get offended. Uh, you can use your microphone or the chat, and then Tom here is going to help out with that as well. Uh, so please take advantage of that. All right, so definitions and terminology, and then I'm going to talk about three algorithms to, to get us started. Linear regression, K nearest neighbors classification, and then a huge one that if you remember one thing from this talk, you're going to want to remember the perceptron method, and I will show you why uh, shortly. All right, so if we're going to talk about machine learning methods, we probably want to make sure we know what machine learning is. So the most compact, correct definition that I've found is automatic programming. So a machine learning program is a program that automatically creates other programs, okay? Programs that create programs. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, sometimes creating a program can be inconvenient. Okay, it might be expensive, it might be tedious, okay, and it can even be so tedious to the extent that it would take millions of lines of source code and, you know, decades to, to write. And so, in that case, it would be impractical, right? And then it can also be so complex that no human or humans could possibly handle that complexity. And so in that case, you would be, you would have programs that are impossible for humans to write. Okay, so these are all cases where you might want a computer to write your program for you. And as I've already mentioned, humans have speed and complexity limitations, no surprise there. And so I'm going to be talking today about a class of machine learning programs called, uh, it, it's a flavor of machine learning called supervised learning. And supervised learning, a, uh, a lot of common algorithms fall into supervised learning. And here is where you automatically program mathematical functions. So if you remember from math class, a function was basically a machine. You give it input and then it spits out some output, right? So input and output. So that's basically all you need to know to understand what I mean by a mathematical function. 
and it all it always gives the the same output for the same input. Now it doesn't have to be like a one number is for input and one number for output. You can take off and run with this. You can input vectors, which are which is an array of numbers. You can have a matrix, two dimensional array, and even higher dimensional examples as well, tensors, if you know what those are. And so, uh, yeah, all of those are what your supervised learning program can create for you. Any questions so far? All right, everybody's good. So here's some jargon. So how do we set up our program to automatically create another program? Well, we have to give it input output pairs. So what I mean by that is if this pro if the output program was working correctly, then every time I give it this input, I want to see this output. Those are the clues that we're going to give the program that writes programs and the process to figure out the function that's called training or learning a model. A model is another word for that function output that I'm talking about. Okay, so we know now that supervised learning creates programs for us, programs that are functions, machines that accept input and give us output. Now let's let's ask ourselves or let let's now, this distinguish between different types of functions that accept input and give us output. So you can have, you could desire, you can request what's called a continuous function. And that just means that doesn't have to be that complicated. It just means that the output can be a range of numbers. So it could be like, for example, you, let's say you wanted zero to a hundred, you can have all all the, you know, one, two, three, four, five, as well as 1.1, 1 1.12, 1 1 every, everything in, in your range is fair game, okay? So that, that's called a continuous function, and that's called regression, if that's the type of supervised learning you're doing, all right? Another way to describe uh, continuous functions is you can draw their plots without lifting your pencil, okay? So there's no breaks, right? That's what I mean by there's a every all the numbers in, in your range are fair game for the output. And so an example of such a function would be a, a linear one, a line, or a cosine function, if you remember that from trig trigonometry, a, a wave shape. Okay. Now, sometimes you don't want a regression, you don't want a continuous function, you just want a few values, for example, a spam detector. You wanna perhaps give it an email and it'll tell you it's spam or it's not spam, okay? So there you don't have like the numbers from one to a hundred, you don't have that or zero to a hundred. And so that's called classification. So you're classifying inputs into different bins. And that if you want the mathematical term for that type of function is called a piecewise constant function, although you don't need to uh, know that if, if you don't like it, that doesn't help you. Okay, and so what are some examples of classification that you're familiar with? So have you ever rounded a number? Like 1.1, you make it become one, or 2.5, maybe you learned you have to round up for that one to three. So you give it a number, a decimal number, and it puts it into a different bin, right? Where one or two or three or whatever it rounds to. Also, a sine function is another example. If, if you, it'll tell you if your number is positive or negative or, or zero, depending on the output. Typically, if it's positive, the output will be a one. If it's negative, it'll be minus one. And then zero can give zero or, or something else that you specify. All right, so regression and classification. So now let's jump into it. Here's our first model. I'm going to show you live code in the notebook. So we're going to automatically program a linear function. So um, a linear function, if you remember when you plotted in high school, it was a line, 
That's, a, that's called a linear function that has a linear plot, a line plot. And the word linear could be more general than that. You can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs, and that could still be referred to as a linear function if, if it obeys certain properties. Okay. All right. So let me now switch to a notebook and you can see some practical stuff instead of just theory. And again, if you, if you, um, go to the GitHub, you can pull down the notebook that I'm using right now. And if you don't have your own favorite program to do Jupyter notebooks, uh, let me show you a wonderful free service that I just discovered. So um, have you guys ever heard of Google Colab? C-O-L-L-A-B. Okay, so if you're listening, you could, you could go to Google Colab and it'll run your Jupyter notebooks for you. Okay, that's one way you could do it. All right, so anyways, so let's continue. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so linear regression, and I'm gonna start really simple and we'll get more complex uh, later. But um, what I have here is I have me a measurement from a, let's, an ice cream company, a hypothetical ice cream company. And depending on how much sunshine you have, the ice cream, ice cream company sells uh, a certain amount of ice creams. And so you see here data in this array. So the first number, what you might call the X value, the input, like the, this first example, 5.6. So if I have 5.6 hours of sunshine, I'll sell nine ice creams. If, I, if there's only four hours, apparently it goes down to five. And then 1.9 hours of sunshine, three. So you get the idea, all right? So scroll down. Okay, and so one thing we might want to do is plot our data so that we uh, get a better feel for it. So here is a plot of this data. So here, you, and I think I'd have to make it smaller to fit on the screen. But here you see the hours, the, the number of ice creams sold per hour. And as you might expect, the more sunlight, the more ice creams that you sell. All right. So, um, all right. So you could imagine a function. You could imagine a line. You could, you can, you can, I can see a line that I can draw through the middle of those points that approximates the trend. And then I can use that line. I can plug in sunshine and it'll, I'll find the point on the line and that'll give me a good estimate for how many for how many ice creams I'll expect to sell. Okay. And if you play with a ruler and you draw a line kind of you kind of ballpark it and then you you figure out the slope and you figure out your line equation. So if you do that, you are creating that linear function. But Imagine that w this was a much more complex problem and we, we didn't know how, to, or maybe we didn't know how to do that. So we're gonna have the computer do it for us. So there is a, a famous algorithm called least squares regression that minimizes the square distance of the points from our candidate line, all right? And so here you see the code in NumPy to calculate uh, all of that, and it spits out, you see there the slope of the best line and the intercept, that just means where it crosses the vertical axis. And so be below that, I, I have my model function. So there it is. There is our first machine learning program, all right? Now, again, it's, uh, this, uh, this function is technically an, a, another program. I had a program to, cre to create this program. Now it's not that impressive, but it's still technically a machine learning program. And so let's plot that and see how good it, gave, it got, all right? So there you see it. So that's, that's our line, our linear function generated uh, using machine learning, all right? And 
So that's linear regression. All right. Any questions on that? That's pretty clear, I think, right? All right. Now let's make predictions. So check this out. Now we can use our model and we can maybe we're the ice cream owner and we can we can do real work with it. We can plug in, we can give it the hours of sunshine and look, it, it's telling us how many ice creams we can expect to sell. Now, what's interesting is if you look at our data, our data doesn't go all the way down to zero hours of sunshine. And it doesn't also, it doesn't go up to 10 hours of sunshine. Nevertheless, you can use the model to extrapolate. You, so you can, you can use the model to predict values that weren't even in the range of your data. Okay, here you see 10.5, all right? So that's, that's our first example. And if you, we're using this in, in a, a job situation, a real practical, where you're solving real problems, you might have, you know, hundreds of input variables and it might even output several input variables. And so for real work, you really couldn't even plot this. I mean, it would be in a higher dimensional space, which we can't even imagine or, or even make a model of, a picture of. And so there we just have to, rely on our computer program and we can't really see it unfortunately but this is a, a simple example where you can see you can get an intuitive sense of what's going on okay so linear regression and some also not only do people create linear functions but you can imagine a where your data kind of curves up and uh, so maybe you want some some nonlinear functions some kind of parabola situation x squared Okay, so there's lots of different types of regression. Okay, so now let's go to our next flavor of machine, or next method, next algorithm. And so the next one, this is a very nice one to also understand if you're a beginner. All right, before I get into the, the grand finale, the per perceptron method. So here, this is, if I didn't tell you how to do machine learning, you might actually come up with this algorithm on your own, okay? It's, it's what you might think to do if you were staring at data the way I'm going to show you, all right? So what you do is you simply find the most similar elements. So for example, let's say you wanted a program that could tell the difference between a cat and a dog. So suppose your program had memorized, you had, it had stored hundreds of pictures of cats, hundreds of pictures of dogs. So one brainless way that it could figure out the difference is if you give it some input, if you give it a new picture of a cat, it'll simply compare the pixels. And if it finds, if there's a cat picture that's closer than any of the dog pictures, then it'll guess that it's a cat. Right, so it's it's a simple comparison. That's that's really all there is to k nearest neighbors, and it's called k nearest neighbors because you might be motivated or have reasons to not just compare compare it to one, in this case, one photograph of a cat, but maybe multiple just to be safe. All right, and if it was so, if it was close to the pixels, the 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 if it was close to three cat pictures and two dog pictures, you can imagine you're going to go with the one that has the higher number, in that case, cats. Okay, again, that's all uh, pretty intuitive and pretty easy to understand. Now, this is such a nice algorithm. You might wonder why we don't just use this all the time, since it's so simple and powerful. And this one doesn't scale very well, if you know what that means. So think about the situation where we had a, like a thousand cat photos and a thousand dog photos. So every time I give it some input and I, that I want it to determine if it's a cat or a dog, it has to compare it to a thousand cat pictures, a thousand dog pictures. Well, that that can get pretty expensive. And then if you imagine having a million cat pictures and a million dog pictures, well, now you're really, you know, that's that's really getting uh, expensive. And so that's the reason why this is only used for uh, uh, 
simple data examples, all right? Uh, nevertheless, it's still a, a bona fide machine learning method in addition to the linear regression. And this one is uh, interesting because it's not regression. This is classification. And so let me now show you some real code and an example of classification using k nearest neighbors. So we're going to go to a different hypothetical situation rather than our ice cream company. We're going to move beyond that. So here, I'm going to introduce you to irises. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the flowers of irises. So do you see how there's, there's big leaves that stick out pretty far from the center and then there's smaller leaves? There's, and there's three of each. Okay, so one of those is called the petals. You've probably heard petals before. And the other kind is called sepals. So you have petals and sepals and different species of irises will have diff typically have different lengths of petals and different lengths of sepals. So similar to the cat and dog classification program, let's say we wanted to, we had an, every time somebody brings us a new iris, we want to be able to measure the length of the petal, petals, measure the length of the sepals, and then use K nearest neighbors to figure out what species it is. All right, so why don't we think, try to think about that, okay? So here I have some data, okay? And what this data here is, if I can highlight it. So here we have three numbers. Remember for the line, we only had two numbers, one input, one output. So two of the numbers are the petal and sepal measurements in centimeters, I believe. And then the third one is how we classify it, okay? And so you see there zero or one, depending on whether it's one type of iris or another type, okay? So that's, that's different than regression. And so let me go ahead and make a plot of this data. And I might as well at this point recommend a tool that I didn't talk about last month, but matplotlib is great. It's a wonderful open source program. I've met the creator and it, it's great for creating plots to analyze data in machine learning, okay? So in this case, I'm gonna make uh, another the, old, the other one was a scatter plot because you, it puts a bunch of points on the screen. So I'm going to do the same on their plot. I'm going to do the same thing here. Okay, so I have the purple, the dark colored points are species A, and the yellow points are species B. And you see that the vertical axis is the sepal length in centimeters and the petal length in centimeters. And so if I bring you new uh, a mystery flower and I have the sepal length and petal length, we'll find where it ends up on this plot, okay? And if it's right here inside this cloud of purple points, then it's probably species A. And if it's closer to this gang of yellow points, it's probably species B, right? So distance is what we're going to use to, to determine the classification, okay? The, is it closer to a bunch of purple points or is it closer to more yellow points, okay? And so how do we do that? So once again, I'll, I'll write some NumPy Python code. And so I'm using NumPy instead of really long Python for loops. And the reason for that is when we deal with large data sets, we're going to want to supercharge our Python programs. And so NumPy, as I said last month, is great for handling, you know, a, a, a matrix, a vector, a tensor of numbers all in one shot. So that's why you'll see my code looks kind of strange if you're not familiar with NumPy. But here, um, I'm defining a model function, and I first find the, the, the distances, in this case, square distances, because I don't want to, there's no reason to take the square root. 
I can just find which one is the closest square distance uh, instead of distance. So you, here I'm, I'm taking the square of, if you know uh, the Pythagorean theorem, you might know how to calculate distance. So that's basically the Pythagorean theorem, if you know what that is. And so below that, I return, I return the classification closest to uh, that input point, the sepal length and petal length, all right? And so there you have it. And so that is, that is our machine learning model, okay? So we're gonna create we're gonna create this machine uh, that just compares points. All right, and so let's now look at let's make a new plot, and this time every location that is a that is the purple that's species A. We're gonna I'm gonna make that with a purple dot and every one that's species B. I'm gonna make sure I don't get it backwards. Yeah, I'm gonna make it a yellow dot. Okay, so I'm gonna color now the entire the entire plot. Okay. So let's scroll down. And again, I'm using matplotlib. And uh, you can see there that uh, you can see which points are gonna be labeled species A and which ones are gonna be labeled species B. But what's interesting is the border, okay? And if you notice, everything on the left side of the border is going to be denoted by, is going to be claimed to be, or categorized as species A, and everything on the right side is species B. And it's not a straight line this time, right? It has to curve in such a way that it's telling us which, it, whether it's closer to a purple point or a yellow point. So this one we can't call a nonlinear function. It's not a straight line. So uh, we're moving beyond that now. And so this is a very nice example of k nearest neighbors. And so um, yeah, and so once again, we love k nearest neighbors because it's simple, but it doesn't scale very well. Calculating all of those square distances is going to get overwhelming when the data sets get too large. All right. Any questions on that? Everybody good with those? Okay. And now we're going to get to the most important topic for today. If you remember one thing, you really want to pay attention to the next part. Okay, so perceptrons. So this is a linear classification method. So if you you saw my iris example and it, the border was was this zigzag. So here, this is going to give us a line. Okay, well that doesn't sound sounds like we're we're taking a step backwards. Okay, but bear with me. Okay, it's going to turn out that this method it corresponds to neurons in your brain, okay? So I don't know how much you know about the current state of uh, artificial intelligence, but what has everybody really excited is what's called neural networks, and especially what's called deep learning, which just means very large neural networks. And every day we hear about people making better uh, programs that could understand our speech that can translate languages and that could not only determine dogs and cats but thousands of different animals so the reason for all this magic is people have the computing power and the knowledge to train these massive neural networks well just like our brains these really impressive programs are are made of a large number of these uh, neuro, these these neuro, the neurons in our brain, and so the magic in machine these machine learning programs, uh, it, we're going to have lot. We're going to wait me back. So we're going to have lots of neurons, is what I'm saying. Just like our brains have lots of neurons, and that's how the magic happens. Now for this example, we're only going to have one. We're going to simulate one neuron. So my challenge to you. I'm going to assume you want to do some sexy, awesome stuff in machine learning. 
then my challenge to you is please try to understand one neuron. If you can understand one neuron, you're on your way to doing cool deep learning stuff. Now, it is possible you might say, well, I'm just gonna use libraries and we're gonna talk about good machine learning libraries in the future. But if you wanted to understand, if you wanted to begin to understand how all this magic is currently happening in the news, then uh, continue to pay attention to the perceptron method, okay? So here's a picture of a neuron in someone's brain and you see these little paths going into this blob. So the way our, the neurons in our brains work is electrical signals go through those paths and some of them are inputs kind of like a function, like a math, mathematical function. And then if there's a elect, certain electrical impulses on certain of those uh, in, well, inputs, then other, there, there'll be electricity, there'll be electric impulses generated on other, uh, other uh, little spindly things there, whatever you call those, okay? So in other words, neurons are like a mathematical function, okay? So, we're going to model the, the real neuron, but by an idealized case. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have a function that accepts numbers as inputs. These are going to be like the strength of the electrical impulses. And we're going to multiply those numbers by other numbers. These are called the weights. And so we're going to take what's called a weighted average, if you know what that is. And then we're gonna, for kicks, we're gonna throw in, we're gonna add another number. Well, it's not really just for kicks. It, it actually makes the neuron more flexible. Uh, but this, this is called the bias, okay? And we're gonna put all that together. And if all of that math gives us a positive number, then the neuron is gonna fire. If it doesn't give us a positive number, it's, it's not gonna fire, okay? So you could think of it like a positive number detector almost, okay? So I said that the inputs get multiplied by these weight numbers and the bias gets added. So here's the picture version of that and then here's the algebra version. So I have weights and biases as I've already said and I'm multiplying all the weights W1, W2, W3 and so forth by all those little inputs, input numbers, I1, I2, I3, and then I add the bias B. And so that's what I'm detecting. I'm detecting if that is uh, positive or not, okay? All right, so moving on. All right, so the trick is to figure out these weights and these biases so that the neuron does something useful. So you remember from the my iris example, we use k nearest neighbors to figure out certain numbers in our model that allowed it to, to be accurate, to predict uh, what a mystery flower is, a mystery iris, what type of species it is. So here we're going to, whatever we wanna do, we're gonna figure out the weights and bias and they're gonna be different for each specific application, all right? Okay, so how are we going to find the weights and the biases, you ask? Now, and furthermore, we, we might have, and this actually happens where you have thousands, thousands, if not millions of these weights. So how in the world could we possibly figure out all of that, all of those numbers and bring it in for a landing, okay? So the, what we're going to do, imagine if you had to descend a mountain in the dark with a small flashlight, okay? How would you figure out how to make your way down a mountain with, if all you had was a small flashlight? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would shine it on the ground all around me, 360 degrees, and I would find which direction is the, is the ground sloping down more. Okay, so that's probably the way to go. And then I take a step and then I would do it again. 
And then maybe in one direction, there's a tree. I don't want to bump into the tree, so I have to change direction. And then I'll figure out where it slopes down the most. And by doing that, you can imagine slowly winding your way to the bottom of the mountain in the dark. OK, and by doing that and changing directions, you can avoid or you can deal with ridges and valleys and trees and other things that come up. So this is how we're going to do the extremely complex um, situation of figuring out all the weights in order to translate from English to French or uh, whatever other sophisticated program you want to create. OK. Now, I'm going to go into some details now. And again, if you want to understand deep learning and neural networks, uh, please try to understand this one neuron. OK, so I'm, get, I'm going to define an input and output pair by I and O. OK, and we're going to find um, we're going to find this right here. We're going to find some some number times the difference of our output and the the output that we want and the output that our perceptron is giving us. OK, so the difference between what we got and what we want, what we got and what we want. And then we multi again, we multiply that by this number L called the learning rate. OK, and so why is that going to get us down the mountain with the flashlight? OK, so. Let's look at this example. So here I have the learning rate in the first column. Here I have the output that I want. OK, let's say it's just like the the iris example where we're trying to classify and there's two categories. OK, so in the first row, I have a one. All right, I want to get a one and the perceptron is giving a one. OK, so in that case, the difference is on the last column it gives is zero. OK, so we don't want to make any changes to our weights because it's doing exactly what we want it to. All right, so the difference is telling us stop. You're good. Don't don't mess with the weights anymore. Now let's go to the second row. Let's say the output that we want is a one, but now our perceptron is giving us a zero. So it's remember it, it has to be positive. The value the, the calculation has to be positive for the perceptron to fire. OK, so here the difference one minus zero, of course, is one. You multiply it by the learning rate, so you get this small, this positive number. So you can imagine, you can imagine, we're, if we want a more positive number, let's bump up our weights. Let's 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 add a, a small number to our weights, and that might get us where we want to go. Right. Let's look at the third row. So here we want a zero, so we don't want to classify that, whatever it is. But our perceptron in the third row, third column, it's giving us a one. So it is classifying. So we don't want it to fire. OK, so for that example, we want to calculate the difference, zero minus one, multiply it by the learning rate, and we get this small negative number. So that suggests that we're going to, we're going to, or we are going to do it. We're going to, we're going to lower the weights. We, we don't want to have a positive number, right? OK, and then in the last row, we want a zero. We're getting a zero from our perceptron. So the difference gives us a zero and that hints that tells us that we don't want to make changes in that. For that situation, all right. Is that clear? Everybody good on that? OK. OK, so here's the specifics, the 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 exactly what's happening in the perceptron method and and something similar is happening in deep learning okay um or it builds on this this algorithm this method okay so we're gonna that number that we just figured out here on the far left column we're we're not actually going to add that to the weights we're going to add that number multiplied by the input okay and all the inputs, there's lots of inputs, they're going to make a vector. So we're going to multiply that calculation by the input vector. And that's what we're going to add to all the weights, which make a weights vector. All right, so that that's the algorithm right there. Try to make sure you understand that because we're going to we're going to do some. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you two examples using using this simple idea. OK, and then likewise, 
that the, the calculation we had here on the last column, that is explicitly going to be added to the bias without any modifications, okay? That is right there, add that exactly the way it came out to the bias. Okay, so let me show you uh, some examples of using the perceptron method classification. And I'm going to show you two, by the way. Okay. Okay, so here I have, I'm going to, I'm do, I'm going to do, do the iris example again. Okay, and here is my data. And I want to figure out a line that divides this data, similar to what K nearest neighbors did. Remember, perceptrons will give us a line. OK, and so we want to, again, automatically or have the program create this dividing line, that wall, uh, without us having to do it. OK, and we are not going to use the simple K nearest neighbors. We're going to use that method I just showed you. OK, and so, um, yeah, and so what I did was I, where did I, OK, so here you see the model, OK? right here, this, fun, this these two lines, and then above that, and again, I'm, I don't expect you to, maybe, maybe you can understand this Python code on the spot, but maybe you want to look at this after the, the talk, and, uh, oops, sorry about that, uh, all right, so here, and yeah, this box right here is what I want to focus on, so here you see the learning rate, Point one, uh, the number of, e so I haven't talked about epochs. That just means how many times you, you, you go around the horn, how many times you, you do those calculations for all the inputs. So in this case, I'm going to do it five. Now, why am I going to do it five? Because all of those calculations, remember, they're adding those little numbers. So each of those is like taking one step down the mountain. And obviously, we might have to take multiple steps. So here, it turns out to go down this quote unquote mountain, I, I'm going to take five steps. And I'm going to, so I'm assuming that that's enough. Now, in other cases, maybe you need more steps, more epochs. Okay, but for the simple example, five will do. So you see here, I am defining the weights. Initially, I don't know what the weights are. So I'm going to set them all to zero, all two of them. Same thing with the bias. I don't know what that is, so I'll just begin with zero. And then let's take a couple steps down the mountain with the flashlight. So I make a prediction. Okay, so this is what this is the perceptron. This is that capital P. So the perceptron is going to do the best it can with those weights and biases. And then we're going to compare that to uh, what we really want. All right, we have we have our the data includes the input and the desired output. And so by uh, we're and then so we're going to do that calculation I showed you, and that's going to update the weights and the bias. Okay, and so again we run through that for all the data points, all the input output pairs, and then we we do that for the number of epochs. Okay, and so and there you have it. And so that's how we created this iris species classifier. All right. So any questions on that? And again, for real life examples, you will of course have much more inputs and outputs. And so you won't be able to make a nice instructive plot like this, all right? So now let me close with something a little bit more interesting, a little bit more dramatic. So people actually did real work with this, okay? so. Let's see. All right. So here I have a picture of handwritten digits. Okay. And so this is, you could imagine people writing their zip codes on envelopes. And before computers, somebody had to manually look at that and try to figure out what the zip code was and make sure 
right? The envelope, your mail gets sent to the right place. Let's try to use the perceptron method to automatically detect numbers, okay? Now, people's millions of envelopes are being sent every day through the US Postal Service. So you can see that now we're not playing around anymore. This, would, this actually would save millions of dollars, okay? And what's interesting is you could have made, you still can, you could make a program that literally could save people millions of dollars just by knowing the perceptron method. Okay, that's all you need to know in order to uh, do what I'm gonna show you here. Okay, now we're not gonna be able to solve the entire problem, but I'm gonna make a, a perceptron, I'm gonna use the perceptron method to make a program that can detect the number eight, just the number eight. And so if you look at the picture there, you can see that people draw the eights in lots of different styles. Uh, some people are left-handed, and so you can see the where it finishes, and then other people are right-handed, and I can see it finishing in the other direction. Some people do something that really bugs me. Uh, I still remember this girl that did this in ninth grade that I, just annoyed me. They, they do an eight by doing separate circles. They lift their pencil and do the second circle. <laughs> that always bugged me, but that's another way you can do an eight, all right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the input is, so we're gonna feed it pictures of numbers, of single numbers. And, and so the input is gonna be the value of all the pixels, the colors of all the dots in our image. So if we have, I believe, each picture in our data set is 23 by 23, okay? So that is whatever, that's over 400 pixels. So remember the, remember the neuron example I showed you? So we're gonna have over 400 lines going into the neuron, 400 of those little splindly things uh, bringing in data, one, one line, one input for each pixel. Okay, and so we're going to have to have over 400 weights, one for each of those pixels as well, and then the bias, of course. And somehow we have to train that whole mess and hope that it's accurate enough to actually correctly predict an eight. And if we feed it like a four, or a, a nine is kind of close to an eight, actually, right? So we want to make sure it doesn't confuse a nine with an eight, or a three is really bad. That's really close to an eight. So can we make it smart enough to not think of three as an eight? Okay, and so let me scroll down. So here is our data, and I'm what's uh, various institutions and colleges have made have open sourced lots of data that is useful if you're learning machine learning, and one famous one is MNIST the Modified National Institute of Science and Technology data set, and they literally have images of numbers so that you can train a, a machine learning model to detect handwritten numbers like I'm doing here, okay? So I, I put a subset of that data set on the GitHub for DAML, and so I'm just gonna pull it from that GitHub in my notebook, and here you see the learning rate, so this is a this is a little bit or actually a lot more complicated example than the than the iris classifier. So the mountain is going to be a lot more complicated that we need to descend. There's going to be a lot more ridges and valleys. So we don't want to take too big of a step and end up in a tree or in a ditch and break our leg. So the learning rate here we're going to we're going to dial it down really small. Yeah, okay, so very carefully we're going to update our weights and biases. And then the number of epochs, remember each of those is like a step. So here, because this is more complex, let's assume if we take 100 steps, we are pretty close to the bottom of the mountain, okay? And so I've, I've comment, I've, I've super commented the, the program that does this so that you could inspect it and study it after uh, our session today, all right? Um, this is gonna have a couple more things that you need to know about. So min-max normalization, what's that? So 
it turns out that in order to avoid issues, if we have a, a set of numbers, it's it, we would rather have the numbers all be between zero and one. It turns out that that's just cleaner and can avoid lots of problems. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to subtract some numbers and divide by a, a, another number, and we're going to do this operation to shift all the numbers to scale them all between zero and one, and that's called a min-max normalization. Okay, so you can read the comments there, uh, and uh, you can see how that's done. All right, and now in this other function, init data, I'm going to do a, and the, you learn the, these are things you learn by pain and suffering. So presumably somebody wasn't shifting their data to zero and one, and that was causing problems. So they said, hey, I figured out that that's useful. Well, here's another thing that's useful. It turns out that your input data, if you, if you have, if you have like a bunch of eights followed by a bunch of other numbers, that can cause issues. It's better, in other words, if you just mix everything up so that the eights are kind of spread out amongst the other numbers. And so what that means here is we're going to want to shuffle the data in case it's not random, the order's not random already. So that's what this random shuffle numpy command here does, okay? And then you see below that I do the min-max normalization, and then I do um, another, uh, some other code, which you can read about in the comments, okay? And so, yeah, and so there you have it. So now our data is shuffled, uh, adjusted, the numbers are adjusted, and so let's go ahead and, oh, by the way, here's the accuracy. This is going to, remember, we can't plot it, so we're, we're running blind, so all we could do is, is the, calculate the accuracy using algebra and uh, see what number that gives us. And so here's the model, okay? And the model that we're going to end up with, we're going to, uh, the way that we're going to multiply the weights by all the inputs is we're going to do what's called a matrix. We're going to set it up so that it's what's called a matrix multiplication, okay? And we're going to do them all in one shot. And then you can see there the greater than zero. Remember the perceptron was like a positive number detector. You can see that there. And so, yeah, that's basically what we're going to end up with. So now let's learn the weights and biases. So that's this learn function. And again, you see there the e I have a for loop and I'm doing the number of epochs that I want. And this time I'm the weights, I'm going to start with some random values. Okay. Instead of zero. Now you could start with zero, but I've chosen not to. Um, and then below that, yeah, so then I, I start updating the weights. And you see there the learning rate, the, the difference, the, per, the output minus what the model is giving us. So yeah, this is a, similar to the iris classifier, all right? And so we run that on our data, the subset, uh, however many hundreds of pictures that has, okay? And so here I... Uh, invoke the, the initialized method, init data method, the learning method, and then I get my weights and bias, bias. And so here I will show you the output. Whoops, let's see. Okay, so there, there you have it. So here, this huge list of numbers, that's all the stupid weights. One, well, maybe not stupid, but Every pixel, there was over 400 pixels, so there's however many 23 times 23 is. That's, and the bias, so plus one, and that's all the weights and biases right there. And that we got from a perceptron method, okay? And so if I scroll down after all the, the, uh, the dumping of all the weights and biases, and this goes on for a while, at the bottom, you should see the accuracy calculated. Okay, yeah. So the the it was almost ninety percent accuracy. So that means nine out of ten, it's gonna hit the right note. It's gonna guess nine out of ten eights to actually be eights. And um, you see there, I have training and testing. So let me close by 
to tell you what's going on there. So we obviously need to train the model. And so we've got data to train the model, but we also want to test the model to see how good it is. Now, we want to use different data to test the quality than we use to train it, okay? Because if we test it with the training data, then well, it, it learned that really well. So that's going to give us an incorrect assessment. So we separate our data into two, uh, two piles, and we use some of it to train and some of it to, to test. Typically or commonly, you'll have about 70 or 80 percent of your data for training and then 20 or 30 percent for testing. OK, and so as I and so here you see that on the training data, the stuff that it's familiar with, it was close to 90. But then if you surprise it with new data that's never seen before, well, then it drops down to 86. So it's 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 common that you will see the testing accuracy lower than the training accuracy. And so it's but it's still pretty good, right? It only it only dipped what, like four ish percent. So 86 percent with my little simple perceptron method. And so, yeah, so there's there's a, a uh, we started with a simple linear regression and we ended with something that's probably a lot more impressive, all right? And so again, I, I commented this uh, really well and I encourage you to download this and study it. Um, if you are curious and you wanna learn more, I, here at the bottom I have some things you could also do now. So you might want to investigate additional regression and classification methods. And especially you might want to do ones involving massive or more data, right? Here I had ones that had few inputs and few outputs, but you might want to take a stab at uh, trying to make models that have several inputs and several outputs. Well, the my number classifier had the hunt over 400 inputs, so that's already kind of getting impressive but maybe you want to take it up to a thousand inputs. I don't know. And then if you don't want to code it all yourself, although I encourage you to do that a couple times to learn it, uh, you can look into libraries that do the heavy lifting for you. So one really nice one for beginners and even for professionals is um, called Sci Scikit-Learn. Okay, so I would look into that if you want a nice library to automatically do stuff for you. Right. So any questions on any of that? So yes. So you knew that your program is programmed to have a high Python is likely correct, but it has no bugs because of the high degree of data accuracy. Uh so uh, so I would say that the accurate, so the question was, does the high accuracy tell us that we don't have bugs in our program? Okay, now I wouldn't say it proves that there's no bugs, but I think it's really good evidence because yeah, typically I remember training when I was writing, calc when I first made this program, yeah, any little mistake will, you know, blow your accuracy. So it's it's really difficult to get all the you know make your card house to stay up and not fall get everything right to get a high accuracy so yeah that's that's pretty good evidence that things are working correctly any other questions um how would this relate to like facial recognition so because you'd be looking at photos you're looking at pixels which would you know also right. similar to the pictures of the members. Yeah, so how does this relate to facial recognition? So facial recognition is a massive classification problem. Okay, now, um, if you want, so if like what I, if you wanted to detect, you know, be able to say, okay, this picture is, is this specific person. And if you had a lot of people, that's a massive classification problem. Now, before you did that, you might want to be less ambitious and maybe create one that could maybe like detect if it's a male or female. That would be a binary classification pro program or, or maybe their ethnicity or their age. Okay. 
their age, that would actually be a, re a regression, right? Because it's not just a few categories, a couple of categories, it's that uh, continuous function. So yeah, um, so that, that also falls into my definitions. Interesting, thank you. Sure. All right, so uh, if there's no other questions, so let me just uh, remind everybody that I'm doing a back to basics series. And so this is the second one and there'll be another one next month and the month after. And again, the we have the GitHub, which you can get all the stuff I show you in these talks. And oh, also let me remind you again, please give us feedback. Let us know how we could improve things and help you help us to help you and the at the bottom of the announcement on the meetup page there's a link to the feedback form so if you please do that and then again the slide had my email address so please contact me i'd love to talk about machine learning and uh yeah so I will be happy to continue the conversations. Let me go back to that page. Yeah, CS, remember I said machine learning was automatic programming? So I made this little website, uh, automaticprogramming.info, and uh, you can reach me at CS, CS, Chris Severino, my initial CS at automaticprogramming.info. All right. All right, so thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. All right.